series that we started uh, for the last several weeks or months uh, called The Age of Hope. The Age of Hope. And uh, it is uh, our kind of post-resurrection series, uh, still in the season of Easter, uh, but still allowing us to appreciate and understand that God has given you and I all kinds of good hope that we can uh, build our lives upon. And, uh, you know, since we are people of resurrection, uh, how many of you know we're always reminded that uh, no matter what's going on in our lives, as we uh, say for about 30 minutes, just a few minutes ago, uh, God's love never fails. Amen? And um, I don't know about y'all, I'm going to be singing that all. I remember the first time I heard them sing that, we were at a seascape. And I said, man, that song will pop in the way. Not bad, I was wrong. Right. Right. Uh, John chapter 15 is where we're heading this morning. Um, and it is indeed a, a, a great blessing uh, once again uh, to be able to open the Word of God and for all of us to spend some time reflecting on uh, this great gospel that has been given to us. Uh, the gospel according to John chapter number 15. Uh, this gospel is written by the uh, disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, the disciple who uh, was probably the youngest disciple. Many people think John was a teenager wow. when he responded to the voice of the Lord. So all you teenagers wow. in here that feel like uh, this, uh, you, you're too young to follow Jesus, amen. You may just find yourself writing the gospel that'll, that'll uh, uh, last for uh, ages at a time, amen, amen. That, that uh, John was one of these young folk who actually was so compelled and in love with uh, Jesus and the message that Jesus uh, really uh, 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 preached, that John uh, spent most and the rest of his life spreading this gospel, many people think, uh, in uh, parts of Asia. He was one of the uh, uh, gospel writers that actually took a different kind of take on the gospel. Uh, you find in the first three books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're called the Synoptic Gospels. And these Gospels tend to pull from many of the same sources, and they kind of tell different uh, experiences that people had with Jesus, but they all wrote them with a particular audience in mind. But in the book of John, you find some of the greatest expressions of theological uh, precision uh, in uh, all of the Gospels combined. In the book of John, you see... John making an undeniable case that Jesus is God and that God is Jesus and they both are one. They both are uh, inseparable. They both have and share the same attributes uh, and they both share and have the same power. But their identity and their purpose and their function are one and the same. And John goes on throughout the whole book of his gospel. He shows the mastery that Jesus has over nature and over certain kinds of uh, 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 circumstances. And this is important for the audience that John is writing to because many people during that time, they were called Gnostics, G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S, Gnostics. They were often uh, very much curious about Jesus, but their orientation to Jesus was, you know, very suspicious. They did not feel like Jesus was truly who John and others were saying Jesus was. Many of them felt like Jesus was uh, 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 a ghost that just appeared to be human. Because in their minds, uh, there was nothing good and redeemable about being human. They had a very low value on the human body. And they felt like to evolve uh, is to lose your humanity and to transition into some ethereal or spiritual space. And they had all these secret knowledge uh, clubs. And they were feeling like you can only get certain things unless you had a special revelation. So John was attempting to help them understand, listen now, let's not get too, you know, far out there. Not only was Jesus fully God, but he was also fully human. And there's so much at stake there for him to be fully God and fully human. Uh, one of the writers uh, in, in, in the first uh, few centuries, they say, uh, what God did not assume, God could not redeem. Which, which goes on to just argue that if Jesus was not fully human, then humanity could not fully be redeemed. 
Um, it's a fascinating set of kind of connections that are being made uh, in the real life humanity and divinity of Christ. And so we come to a passage that uh, is one of my favorites. It comes up in our lectionary, and, and uh, whenever I get a chance to preach some of my favorite passages that come up in the lectionary, I jump on it. Amen. Because it is a great blessing and a great gift. So let's take a look at verse number uh, 1, chapter 15. And I'm reading from the message translation, so it may read a little bit differently than yours, but it's all good. Uh, we, we all in the same ballpark. All right? Uh, I am the real vine. Jesus is speaking. And my father is the farmer or the husbandman. He cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear grace. And every branch that is grape bearing, he prunes back so it will be bare even more. And you are already pruned back by the message I have spoken to you. So live in me. Everybody say that. Live in me. Say it one more time. Live, Live in, in me. me. Now, let me just pause right there. That, that, there's something fascinating about Jesus telling us to live in him. Yes. It makes me believe that uh, there's some options that many of us have where we can make our residence. I just want you to appreciate, even as we're working through this Age of Hope series, that uh, there's a lot worse things that you can decide to live in than the hope of God. Come on, right now. And I know some people, particularly in this moment, would love to make you put your hope in a whole lot of other things. But don't ever get seduced or tricked into exchanging the hope of God for a inferior hope of anything else. Uh, give me a high five and tell them live in him. Live in him. Live in him. Make your home in me just as I do in you. Now that's a scary statement. What if you and I really believe that Jesus made his home in us? Now I'm not talking about your house. You know, you, you know, bless your house. You got your altar at your house. I'm talking about everywhere you go, you carry Jesus right along with you. Come on. Yeah. Well. Oh, that shook me up just now. Amen. Every comment you make, every relationship you engage in, every, every, every word that falls off your lips, every kind of gossip, complaining, cussing, fighting. Yeah. You and Jesus just right along together. <laughs> but only by being joined to the vine. Yes. You can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. Amen. I am the vine. Yes. You are the branches. Yes. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation is intimate and organic. Yes. The harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce yes. a Thing. The word of God. For us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. So we're going to speak from the topic simply today. We are connected. Everybody say that. We are connected. We are connected. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you and send your anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. Let it rest upon me and the hearers of this word in Jesus' name. We pray. Let us all say amen. amen. We are connected. Now, again, what's at stake for such a gospel like this and such a message like this when we're talking about connection um, cannot be underestimated. I am continuing to be convinced that the moment we're living in in our country, in our world, in this society, in this era where everyone likes to drive off of being disconnected, or unfettered, uh, this individuality, this radical individuality, this individuality that is often served as a trophy for many of us, right? Like, you know, who do you follow? I don't follow no one. 
And I got my own style, got my own thoughts. You ever met someone like that? I mean, I mean, they just thrive on being radically disconnected. But the truth is, there is nothing that you or I have or can do or exist in that is not connected to something, someone else. I was speaking uh, a couple of conferences over the last few days, one in Tampa at uh, the Exponential Conference where we do a lot of our church growth and discipleship work with, and I was talking about how the history of we as a people in this country, black, white, uh, Asian, Latino, uh, on and on, all the different polka dots, everybody, amen. We, we share a connected history. And when we try to disconnect ourselves from our history, we can experience certain events and interpret them all wrong. All of this challenge uh, that we are facing all across the country with police brutality, with mass incarceration, with uh, wealth inequities, with uh, the kind of fragmentation of families and communities, all of this has to be told in a context and a story that has been the American story, the kind of postmodern New Western story, or else we will not understand. We will think that what happened in Baltimore is just an episodic event, and what happened in, 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 in South Carolina, another unfortunate episodic event, and what happened in Ferguson, another unfortunate episodic event, and what happened in San Francisco, another unfortunate episodic event, and what happened in Oakland was another unfortunate episodic event. And how many of you know when you have a whole lot of episodes, that's called a series?
should be taken as gospel. Yeah. Yeah. Just think about that for a second, because what's at stake is when you and I allow other people to do mid diminish our humanity. Mm -hmm. It creates unconscious connections that then we always have to come back to God and ask God to remind us that I am more than three fifths of a human being. for years have, have caused us to have a, 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 a predisposition to not be as troubled when certain folks' humanity is diminished. So the New York Times put out an article that said 1.5 million black men are missing. What kind of, uh, uh, of mental uh, and psychological and emotional preparation has to be laid over this country for all of us to not be outraged that 1.5 million people are missing. Every day in this country, our government locks up tens of thousands of immigrants in private prison detention centers as a contractual obligation. Mm -hmm. What kind of diminishing of our humanity mm -hmm. has to be the pretext for us to feel like that's just the cost of doing business mm -hmm. in this United States of America? Mm -hmm. You see, part of what is at stake when we're talking about being connected to God is that when I am connected to God, I
keep going back to a desolate place every week and believing that the little work you do is actually making a difference. Why? Because I believe that I'm showing up more with more than just a hot meal. As soon as I give you this hot meal, there's some hope that's being transferred. Every time you enter into a shared space with the people of God, you are being filled with hope, and that hope must then be transferred. When he says, I am the bread of life. 
change the worst conditions of our community. And you know, sometimes I wish that I could just fly away. Just go somewhere else. But how many of y'all, there is nowhere else to go? <laughs> Better word may be purged. Yes. 
purge. You know what a purge is, right? It means that you've been cleaned up. Now, the pruning process is necessary for a tree. Why? Because if a tree is going to reach the tree's fullest power and manifestation and maturity and strength and, and, and flourishing, the tree has to cut off certain things because there's only so much juice and energy that's coming from the soil. And when a tree has too many, my wife taught me this with these flowers she got growing outside our house. Well, we gotta get out there and prune them. I'm God bless you, baby. You know. <laughs> One needs to be pruned. You said that, right? I was sit seven. <laughs> Amen. Why? Because offshoots grow off. And those offshoots that grow out of the tree or out of the branch, it sucks away necessary energy from the most important part of the tree. You know, a better word for that may just be a leech. <laughs> How about a leech? Praise the Lord. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of us, we have too many leeches in our lives. And God's trying to cut them jokers off. Now, understand, a leech, when it gets a hold to you, it don't like to let go. So when it's trying to get cut Their life, and it sometimes will even hurt you yes. as it tears off. Yes. But don't be afraid of the purging and pruning pop process yes. because that will allow you to grow yes. in ways you could not grow if you just allow the thing to suck you dry. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things we got to be purged from, things that attach themselves yes. to us. Come on now. That we're not even aware of. David, the one who was after God's own heart, said, Create me a clean spirit and renew the right spirit with me. Purge me. Yes. With Purge me with hyssop. So I may be clean. Wash me so I may be clean. What are you talking about? He's talking about the bears off the up. A pruning process, and now David was praying this after he had just killed somebody, <laughs> married somebody's wife, and trying to lie about. I mean, I think he violated every commandment all in one swoop. He needed a lot of purging. He needed Clorox, praise God. He needed the extra strength Clorox. <laughs> Street and every brother that rolls by would have the 
them. Throw that window down and be hollering at you. <laughs> Whistling at you. Because you've been so objectified and patriarchy, that, that nice little big old word that, that, that really is about making the bodies of women uh, subjected to the whims of men. I got two daughters, so I don't need no patriarchy. Because <laughs> this patriarch. <laughs> you know, folk in jail need prison ministry too. <laughs> Starting from the inside out. That's why I need God to purge me with his stuff. I need God to clean up some things in my life. Why? The scripture goes. I say productive, productive, productive. It don't make any sense for you to live in Christ and Christ to live in you and you do and produce nothing. This is not the gospel, folks. Every command that Jesus gives his disciples is to go produce something. Follow me and I'll make you what? Yes, you Fishes of people. Me? Say, follow me and I'll, I'll just, you, you, you just ride. You ride. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> you got to do some work. Hallelujah. You got to produce something. Come on, I don't have a job. There's never an unemployed child of God. Amen. Come on. Come on. <laughs> There's always work out here to do. Yes. Oh, I don't know what to do. Just do anything. Yes. I was telling the folk before yesterday, how is it that we who claim to, to, to follow and worship the one who came to set the captive free can be so comfortable with captive? Mm -hmm. We just walk around here and just act like, oh, you know, you know, he Well, how much I'm going to get paid for this? There ain't enough money to pay you for your liberation. Some of us struggling, folks want you to struggle inside. 
Maya, is one of them, Maya Angelo, or maybe Maya, or one of them brilliant black sisters, Maya, or who the other one, Zoria Huston, or, or what's the other sister's name? Uh, 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 this is one of them that said something like, uh, people, people will uh, try to kill you in silence and make it your idea. Something like that. Mm. And if folks are trying to destroy you and hurt you, when you don't say that, they'll make it seem like after they destroyed you, it was your idea. Yes. Yes. You didn't want that, you didn't say anything. <laughs> you didn't push back on anything, you didn't tell them to stop. Ain't that something? Ain't that kind of some of the narratives going around? Why don't y'all people go and vote? Man, we vote. Thank you. <laughs> go get a job, we got a job. It ain't no real job, it's a half a job. I mean, I work the full time getting a half of a wage. <laughs> go to the doctor, I'm trying. When I go, I'm barely getting any, any, any attention, or the right attention. We, we was with Brother Antonio yesterday. Him and uh, sister, sister Stephanie had their little baby. <laughs>
branches. My branches. Mm -hmm. You can do anything. As long as you stay connected to God. Hear me on this, child of God. This week, you got some things God needs you to do. You got some assignments God needs you to do. Some of us don't even know what God needs us to do. That's how disconnected we become. We running on autopilot. When the last time you asked God, God, what, what do you want me to do? Yeah. Think about that for a second. We get ready to start another little consecration season for the month of June. Some of us need to start getting ready to ask God, Lord, I want to put my life in front of you. I want you to tell me, what am I supposed to be doing in this season of my life? I know I go to work every day. I know I'm, I'm, I'm inventing new, new uh, uh, things every day. <laughs> so I know. <laughs> what do you want me to do in this season in my life? Can God you speak to me in such a way where it serves as, like in the book of Leviticus, they had the light of fire in the tabernacle and they were charged that the fire must never run out. God, let this fire, what you assign me to do, may it never run out. May it fuel me. Every day I wake up, God, I know. This is what I'm supposed to do. Why? Because I'm connected to you. If I'm connected to you, there's nothing I can't do. There's no mountain I can't climb. There's no injustice I can't overcome. There's no situation I can't defeat. Because the God in me is greater than any God out there. Stand with me, everybody. Come on. Let's.